And it's interesting because a lot of people think stem cells are something brand new that just came into this world recently. And the fact was, I was cloning stem cells back in 1967, 40 years ago. And the significance was, while I was doing this research, I was also teaching medical students. So I was teaching medical students the foundation of how cells work, the conventional story out of the textbook, genes control life, what we call the genetic determinism, the belief that genes control your traits, behavior, your physical characteristics, etc. And what my research revealed when I was studying the stem cells was this, very profound. I put one stem cell in a petri dish all by itself and it would divide every 10 to 12 hours. So it'd be two, four, eight, 16 cells, 32 cells. After about two weeks, I have thousands of cells in the Petri dish, but what was unique? They were all genetically identical. But then I did the experiment. The experiment was to take some cells out of the dish and put them into a separate dish with a different environment. Okay. So I take the cells out of my stem cell dish, put them in a separate dish with a, a different environment and the cells form muscle. But then I went back to the same dish with genetically identical cells in it and took some cells out and put them in a different environment and they form bone. And then I went back to the same dish with genetically identical cells and put them in a third petri dish with a different environment and they form fat cells. And there I was confronted with this reality. All the cells are genetically identical but they had different fate. Fat, muscle, bone. And I said, simple question, what controls the fate of cells? And the answer is, the environment. It was the only thing that was different because they were all genetically identical. So I started to really say, oh my goodness, here I am teaching genes control life to the medical students. And yet the cells were revealing to me that, hey, they all had the same genes, but it was the environment that I put them in. And so the environment controlled their life. And a very simple experiment that is very profound for us today is if I took my dish with plastic Petri dish with cells in it and moved it from a healthy environment to a less than healthy environment, the cells get sick. And if I were a doctor of cells, I, you might say, well, what kind of drugs would you give these cells? And it turns out, no, you don't give the cells any drugs. You just take the dish from the bad environment, put it back into a good environment, and the cells will innately, naturally come back to health again. So how did this realization impact you at the time? Because you, you were teaching something completely different. Yes. You did this experiment and you realized what you were teaching wasn't the full truth. Oh, absolutely. And, and then I had a problem with my colleagues because, first of all, they doubted my work and then I brought them into the experiments and I had them observe them, watch them, and they all said, wow, yeah, the environment controls the cells. Uh, but they wanted to marginalize it, so they would say, oh, that's an exception or an anomaly because we're teaching genetic control. It didn't fit the story. I walked out of the university and said, look, I... I can't keep my integrity and at the same time teach something I know was patently wrong. Uh, so I walked out because I saw that teaching the belief that genes control life was very, very incorrect. And uh, it's very interesting because I did that in 1970, now that's like 30, uh, 40 years ago. And guess what? The new science that is just coming into the forefront of our world today is, is something called epigenetic control. What I was teaching was genetic control controlled by genes. The new science, which is now coming around, is called epigenetic control. And what that means, in the, if you understand the prefix epi means above. So you say epidermis, that means the layer above the dermis skin. If I say epigenetic control, literally it says control above the genes. And this is the new science. And why is it profound? Because when you teach genetic control, you teach victimization. You didn't pick the genes as far as we know. The genes control your traits. You can't change the genes, so uh, you become victimized by your heredity. Uh, and the new science, epigenetic control, reveals how your response to the environment, uh, as you change your response to the environment, you change the fate of your cells, just like in the Petri dish. Uh, uh, and that makes you a master, because you are the one that has the opportunity to change your perception and response, so therefore you're the one that controls your genes. But it took you some time, didn't it, to actually incorporate that in, in your life? Because I know in the Biology of Belief, your book, you talk about you went through a very unhappy period. Yes. Your father was dying of cancer. You had a very messy divorce from your first wife. And you weren't happy. And you thought at that point that actually your genes did influence and you had unhappy genes. And it took you some time to actually realize that in your life, 
you could change things. Yeah, it was very interesting because, again, I was still coming from the programs of my own deep beliefs, which I got from childhood on, uh, about genetic control. And yet, it was funny because I was at that point also going out and beginning to talk to people about this new science, about if you understand what I'm talking about, you can create this fabulous life. And it was fun because in the beginning, I would try to get people together and I'd tell them, you can create this fabulous life. And they'd sit at me and look and go, <laughs> you know, Lipton, for a guy who says you, you can create a life, with, with this stuff. Your life doesn't look that good. Oh my God, I can't just talk about the academics of the new science. To make it work, you actually have to apply the principles of the new science. And that was a change point in my life where I said, well, I'm not going to lecture on this unless I verify to myself that by influencing my personal beliefs and attitudes and things that I can change my biology. And it was wonderful because it only took just a short time to realize how I manifest profound changes in my life by taking in the understanding that how I see the world, my perceptions, uh, control not just my internal biology and my genetics and behavior, but it controls how I create in the world around me. So I went from a world of almost self-destruction into this world of more mastery. But let, let, let's look at practically how you did that, just so people pick up a few clues. Well, the first thing is this. The, the work showed that your mind's perception of the world changes your biology, the chemistry of your body, uh, which changes your cells. And I said, okay, so if you control how your mind operates, then you can control your chemistry. But then here's where the problem comes from. There's two parts to the mind. The conscious mind, which has your personal identity, your spirit, your source attached with it, is a creative mind. The conscious mind can see into the future, can review the past, solve problems. The subconscious mind, the other mind, is more of a habit mind. That's when you learn how to do something, and once you learn how to do it, you don't have to think about it, it's automatic. Well, most of us walk around in the world thinking that we're running our lives with our creative mind. And I'd say, Emmett, what do you want out of your life? And you would say, oh, I want to uh, be healthy, I want to have great relationships, and, and then you try to say, I'm running my life with these beliefs. But science has now revealed that we only run our lives with our conscious mind at most about 5% of the time. So we're running on these subconscious programs. 95% yeah. of the time. Okay. And then the issue is, well, where'd you get the fundamental programs that you yeah. operate from? And here's the, the thing I learned is that it's in the first six years of our lives that the brain is in a functional state, an EEG state, the electrical activity, that is not even in consciousness. A child doesn't even reach conscious brain function until about six. So the first six years of your life, your brain function is lower frequency, which is like a hypnagogic trance, a hypnosis. So the first six years of your life, you're like a television camera recording everything around you, everything you observe, just going in from your uh, observations into your programming. So we acquire beliefs and attitudes and behaviors, not from ourselves, but from our parents and our family and our community. These become the fundamental beliefs. Uh, a very interesting point. Uh, the Jesuits had, were very proud. They would say, give me a child until it's six or seven and it will belong to the church for the rest of its life. What they were saying was what they knew, which science is now finding out, the first six years are programming. Yes. And whatever program you get, that will be the rest of your life. So you were able, by realizing this, to then look at how you were living your life on a practical level and say, I am not going to be governed by these pre-programs. I am going to live my life in a more conscious way. Am, am I oversimplifying well, this? Yeah, it, it, it's, that's a, a fundamental statement of how it works, but it's not as easy yeah, as, oh, okay, that. I've just yeah. changed my thinking about yeah. it. It's like, yeah. well, because as the, the thinking is not that much in our control. The brain is operating, as I said, 95% from the yes. subconscious. Uh, but, but, but how did you actually then get results in a, f a relatively short space of time? Well, the, the first thing, how does the subconscious learn? And that's a very critical thing. Uh, the conscious mind can learn from reading a book. So you, the subconscious can, mind can read a self-help book and you go, wow, that sounds really great. And then you find you read the book, but your life is still the same. And it turns out, why? And the answer is because the subconscious mind is more of a habit mind. Things that you repeat over and over again. Yes. Yeah. So the reality is, if you can stay conscious, be present, 
And when those negative thoughts come in our head, and, and psychologists tell us 70% of the time, the thoughts that are going through our head are negative and redundant. So the same negative thoughts are going through. If you could stop those thoughts, if you could hear them as they come through, like, oh, that's not going to work, or this will never happen, those yeah. kinds of thoughts. If you can hear them and stop them consciously, say, no, uh, uh, change the belief right there. Just give the more positive thing. As you repeat this more frequently and you keep repeating it, the subconscious mind begins to learn. So as a habit, if okay. you stay conscious and you have to work at it, and, and here's why people say, well, how come only 5% from conscious mind, 95 for, from subconscious? Because a conscious mind can think into the future and think into the past and solve problems, then think about it yourself. Most of the time, you're thinking about something. Well, if you're thinking, you're using the conscious mind. Well, if you're using the conscious mind for thinking, then who's running the show? And the answer is, when you're not paying attention and you're thinking about what I'm gonna do tomorrow, your subconscious is running the show. So you use the words, be present. Be present, which be we, mindful. Which we hear a lot, so be mindful, which really means be aware yes. of what's going on, what, so you get an automatic reaction, you're aware of that, and you say, I don't want to go there, that's an old pattern, and you look at a new way to be in that situation. Exactly, and okay. you have to repeat it over and over again yeah. because if you think, well, I, I, I got mad at myself yesterday because I repeated that same stupid thing and I got mad again today because I repeated the same stupid thing and then people give up because they get frustrated and it's like, no, no, it's a habit. So you have to every day, but ultimately you can repeat it. Some of this may take work for people because you have to really be present and yet we're so bombarded with information and our lives are so busy that our conscious mind is almost always wandering trying to resolve issues and problems and things we have to work out which then means the subconscious mind is running the show because you went from and I'm quoting from your book wanting to be anyone but me yes to being I think you quote yourself as the happiest man in the world you felt so happy oh so my you gosh. prove that this can work when I started to apply the new science and rewrite the subconscious so it supported me rather than the programs of limitation or disempowerment that we get from our parents and our community as children, which almost all of us get. When I put in the new programs, all of a sudden I started to find, my goodness, my life completely turned around. Uh, all wonderful things started happening in my life. I was healthier. I haven't been to a doctor in 20 years. I, I, I don't need that. I don't take any of their drugs. Why? Because most of the illness is just from the stress of not living in harmony. Mm -hmm. And when you learn to, to get rid of the limiting programs that we got as children and put in programs that support you, guess what? Then all of a sudden, the place turns into heaven.